All right, we are back with a new video, and today we'll be ranking every player in Survivor history who has been medevaced from the game. Now, this was a bit of a weird list to put together, as I found that a lot of them didn't really play that good of a game at the end of the day. I mean, a lot of them are pre-merge boots, and two of them are even first boots of their season. While even the people that make it to the merge and make pretty deep runs are people that I don't think really had much of a shot of winning the game, and some of which Ami had a chance of being voted out shortly after, even if they weren't medevaced. So that sort of made this list kind of hard to put together, but I still think it's a fun exercise to talk about these players' games. Obviously, there are 16 players to talk about, and I'll mainly be assessing them based on the games that they played on the seasons in which they were medevaced. So no future seasons for people that have returned since then. And with that, let's get straight into the list. So starting off the list at number 16, the worst player that has been medevac for me is Courtney Moon from Survivor One World. Now obviously Courtney is very hard to assess as she was the first boot of her season. And that's part of the reason why she's at the bottom is that there's a lot of uncertainty over how well she would have done even if she hadn't been medevac. But we do know based on the uh, stuff that we saw on the show that she was left out of the initial majority alliance, uh, given her quirky nature. And I'm not too sure she could have ever fit in, even if she wasn't medevac. I feel like she probably would have been an early boot regardless. Now, granted, there were other people on her tribe that were kind of on the outs as well, namely Christina and Nina. However, Courtney still had a good chance of being the first boot, even if she wasn't medevac. And beyond that, I don't think she had much potential to do well in the game. So because of that, I have her here at number 16. Now we're moving on to number 15, and we have someone pretty similar to Courtney Moon, and that is Pat Cusack from David vs. Goliath. Now like Courtney, like Pat was also a first boot, I mean, which obviously makes his game very hard to assess. Although I feel like we have a bit more information about him. I mean, obviously, he emerged as this dominating figure, I mean, with building the shelter, sort of put a target on his back through that way. And there was a chance that he could have been the first boot of the season. I mean, obviously, with Courtney Moon, we at least saw that the Davids had lost the first immunity challenge, whereas in one world, obviously, the challenge was canceled because Courtney got injured. Whereas Pat at least had more of a shot to be the first boot, although we did also see Nick was starting to be talked about as a target. So there was a decent chance that Nick could have been the first boot instead. And I feel like Pat if he had survived that first round, had a bit more potential moving forward than Courtney. But at the end of the day, I still don't think he would have done particularly well. I still feel like even if Nick had gone home at that first tribal, that Pat would have still been talked about as a potential target and potentially someone that is at least left out of the majority alliance. I don't really see how he moves forward in the game much beyond that. Now, it was a bit more possible, but at the end of the day, I still don't think he had that much potential. And plus, with him being the first boot, I can't justify putting him too high. And so he's here at number 15. Now we're moving on to number 14. And again, we have another very early boot, but one that at least survived a tribal, and that is Mike Barassi. Now I actually consider putting Mike a bit higher on the list, as I feel like he had a bit more potential moving forward. I mean, he did vote within the majority at that first tribal to vote on Marissa. And we saw Russell being willing to work with him moving forward. And I'm not too convinced he would have necessarily been targeted next, as I feel like Russell would have been more interested in taking out some of the women, namely Betsy, had they gone to another tribal. I don't really see Mike being taken out too, too soon. But at the end of the day, I still don't think he would have won the game. And I still could have seen him like being uh, targeted for being an older person on his tribe and also someone that could have potentially been a challenge liability. And we saw that with how he was medevaced, where he was medevaced due to an injury he sustained at the challenge. Now, granted, it was a Smurgan Brawl, which is a pretty brutal challenge on its own. But still, he is one of these older people, someone that was definitely prone to injury, someone that was prone to low blood pressure, which ultimately did him in. So I still can't justify him putting, putting him too high. I mean, at the end of the day, he was still the second boot of the season. Although I did have a bit more upside for him moving forward than the pre previous people we talked about. But at the end of the day, he's still here at number 14. 
Now we're moving on to number 13. And now we're moving past the very, very early boots. And we're moving to people that made it a bit further in the game. So obviously a bit more to talk about. But at number 13, we have from Survivor Cambodia, we have Terry Dietz. Now again, this is his Survivor Cambodia game. And obviously Terry's a weird person to talk about on this list as he technically wasn't medevaced. But he was still pulled from the game due to a family emergency. And I feel like most people would group him in as being one of these medevacs as opposed to quitters or some of these other involuntary exit categories. So I'm including here, him here on the list. But even then, I mean, he didn't play that great of a game. I mean, early on, he forms this old school alliance with Kelly Wigglesworth, Vetus, and Wu. However, that group is immediately put on the outs at that first tribal where Vetus goes home. After that, he, he is a part of the split vote plan between Shireen and Spencer, but he's still not in that great of a position. He's still not within that core majority. He think it's a pretty bad tribe swap where, again, it's four Bion members against him and Kelly, w Kelly Wentworth. And obviously, had that tribe ever gone to tribal, the Bions was, would have stuck together and it would have either been Wentworth or him going home. And we saw on the show even that Wentworth was willing to throw Terry under the bus to try to save herself. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether it would have been Wentworth or Terry had they actually gone to that tribal. I mean, I'm inclined to think Wentworth would have gone home, but Terry would have at least been in quite a bit of danger. But obviously, he's pulled from the game before they can ever go to tribal. So obviously, we can't say for sure. But at the end of the day, I mean, Terry didn't play that great of a game. He was rarely in the majority. The only time he was kind of in the majority was at that second tribal where he was part of the vote split. But even then, you know, like he wasn't in the core and it was more so to take out two widely regarded targets in Shireen and Spencer. I don't think he would have done particularly well moving forward, especially if that tribe had ended up going to tribal. So because of that, I have Terry here at number 13. Now we're moving on to number 12, and we have someone pretty similar to Terry in that they lost the numbers early on, didn't get that great of a swap, and obviously was medevac soon thereafter. And like Terry, this is another returning player on a returning season, and that is Penner from Survivor Micronesia. Now, like I said, I feel like Penner has some similarities in this game to that of Terry. I mean, early on, he was aligned with Amy, Eliza, and Yao Man to counter the couple's alliance, and there was actually a good chance that they could have gotten the numbers at that first tribal if Johnny Fairplay didn't quit the game. But obviously, Fairplay quit the game. You know, like They kind of had to vote him out unanimously as a result. And from there, he falls out of the majority when Suri sides with the couple's alliance, and he tries unsuccessfully to save Yao Man at that next tribal. So obviously, Penner kind of gets screwed over by Fairplay quitting the game, but through that, he kind of falls out of the numbers. He gets at a swap where, despite still being with Eliza, he's also there with Parvati and James, two people that would have gone directly after them. Now, again, it's sort of a question over whether it would have been him or Eliza had they ever gone to that travel. And again, I'm kind of inclined to think Eliza would have been targeted earlier. She seemed to be more disliked than Penner. But even then, I feel like Parvati could have definitely gotten the numbers against Penner as obviously she played with him on his original season. And obviously she didn't particularly like him at that point. But like Terry, they never go to tribal post-swap where Penner is obviously medevac obviously due to that knee infection he had at the reward challenge. So we ne can ne never say for sure whether he would have been in that much danger, but it still wasn't that great of a position to be in. So overall, I feel like Penner's Micronesia game is similar to Terry's Cambodia game. Again, a lot of similarities there. The reason I have Penner above Terry, though, is that I feel like Penner fell the numbers. Him falling out of the numbers is more due to bad circumstances than, like, getting outplayed, where obviously, had Fairplay not quit, there was a chance that Penner could have gotten the numbers there. And even post-swap, I mean, he definitely had more of an out there than Terry did, with Eliza being an easier person to convince to vote off. So I feel like there are some more... Uh, things to give the benefit of the doubt to Penner than to Terry. But at the, at the end of the day, they still didn't have the numbers for that much of the game, and they still had a similar trajectory moving forward. And because of that, I have Penner here at number 12. Now we're moving on to number 11, and this is sort of a weird pick. I can see people disagreeing with this one. And to be fair, I consider putting this person a bit lower myself. 
But after thinking about their game more and more, I feel like they should be slightly higher than these people, and that is Shamar Thomas from Survivor Karamoan. Now, obviously, there are a lot of negatives to Shamar's game. I mean, he had a very rocky relationship with much of his tribe, where he got into fights with people like Matt, and obviously he was targeted at each of the tribals he attended. But the thing about Shamar, and the main reason I have him as high as he is, is that he builds a pretty close bond with Sherry. And through that, he has an end to the majority alliance. While he is the minority's target at each of the tribals he attends in the season, he's in the majority, and he has the numbers that are actively saving him. Now, obviously, he's medevaced on day 10 due to an eye injury, and I don't think he really had much potential moving forward. I feel like even if he wasn't medevaced, there would have come a point where even Sherry would have felt like it was doing more harm to save him than it was worth at the end of the day. So I still feel like he would have been cut later on. But I feel like compared to Terry and Penner, he was in the majority for longer than those two were, whereas Terry and Penner were obviously on the outs on their initial tribes, and they obviously got pretty bad swaps as well. Whereas Shamar was at least in the majority, and he had an alliance working to save him, even if I feel like they would have cut him, like, at some point down the road, he was still in that majority, and that's a big reason I have him as high as he is. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's still Shamar. Like, he's not that great of a player, and I don't think he would have won or come close to winning the game at the end of the day. So because of that, I have him here at number 11. Now we're moving on to number 10, and we have another pre-merge boot. Definitely a weird one for me, and that is Caleb Wernolds from Survivor Co. Wrong. Now... I think Caleb played pretty well for the short time he was in the game. I mean, he was pretty well positioned on his beauty tribe, building a tight bond with Ty and gaining the trust of most of the women. He never goes to tribal the entire season, but even if he did, I feel like he would have been safe for at least the first one. But obviously, he was medevaced on day 9 due to heat stroke at the reward challenge, and it's very hard to assess how he would have done had he not been pulled from the game. Although his performance on BB-16 and Game Changers don't give me too much confidence, but if we're just looking at the game he played this season, I think he played alright. Again, had they gone to Tribal, I'm not too sure what, what would have happened, but I think he would have been safe for at least that first round, and because of that, I have him here at number 10. Now we're moving on to number 9, and we actually are on to the first person that made the merge of their season, but obviously didn't last too much longer after that, and that is Joe Doddle from Survivor Token Chains. Now, the thing about Joe is he was in the majority for most of the pre-merge at Jalapau, kind of as a leader figure, but not really. Well, he was at least the leader of the group outside JT, Steven, and Taj, and early on, he generally got his way, as he was the one leading the charge to vote out Sandy. But as time goes on, the JT, Steven, Taj group really start to take over, I mean, he votes out Spencer, which I think was a mistake for him, as I feel like Spencer was someone who was a bit closer to him than he was to JT and Steven. And at their next tribal, he's straight up left out of the Sydney vote. And by the merge, Jalapau is down in the numbers 4-6, to six, and Joe is more than likely Tambira's first target had they gone to that tribal. But of course, he's medevac due to a knee infection, so... Again, Joe kind of played an alright game for the pre-merge at least, but I don't think he had a lot of longevity post-merge. I mean, it was pretty much either him or JT going at that first vote after the merge, although I feel like JT would have done enough to save himself for that vote, and Joe just didn't have much of a shot beyond that. And beyond that, like he, I don't think he was in control the entire way. I feel like he kind of let go of his allies along the way, which kind of caused him to fall out of control on the Jalapal tribe even before the merge. So because of that, I have Joe here at number nine. Now we're moving on to number eight, and we have another player that made the merge, but was taken out shortly after that, and that is Neil Gottlieb from Survivor Co. Wrong. Now, early on, he builds a close bond with Aubrey, and despite initially being on the bottom, they're able to emerge into a swing position by the time of that first tribal, where obviously they get the in the majority that way. Doesn't get the best swap in the world, but I don't think he would have been the immediate target there. I think Nick would have been more likely to be voted out had they gone to that tribal, but they don't go to tribal, and he also finds an idol on the way, so that's good. 
then the merge, he and Aubrey are straight up at the bottom, where despite him having an idol, there was a good chance he would have been on the bottom of that vote. I mean, Aubrey was in a lot of danger to go home going into that tribal, but they're obviously kind of spared by the fact that, well, Neil is medevaced. And obviously he fails to hand off the idol to Aubrey before he leaves, so that's something, but it doesn't really affect too much, so I don't hold it too much against him. So, like Joe, I feel like Neil is someone who was in control for a bit, probably wasn't as out in front as Joe was. I feel like he was more sticking with Aubrey for a lot of the game, but he was still at the bottom coming into the merge and had a good shot, maybe not of being voted out, but certainly of being at the bottom. And that's the main reason I have him above Joe in the sense that he wasn't the initial target going to that vote. Now, some of that's probably due to him having the idol, but I also think Aubrey was just naturally the bigger target going into that vote. So because of that, I have Neil a bit higher than Joe, but still not too high. And I have him here at number eight. Now we're moving on to number seven, and we have someone who is probably a worse player overall than a couple of the people we were just talking about, but they made it a lot further into the game, which is more than I can say for those other people, but probably didn't have that much of a shot of winning. And that is Bruce Honey Guy from Survivor Panama. Now, obviously, Bruce made it very far in the game. He got all the way to the final seven, but it wasn't a very dominant game, and I don't think he wins even if he gets to the end. I mean, if we're looking at his game, I mean, he starts off on Lamina, the older men's tribe, where he didn't connect super well. However, Shane was clearly at the bottom and more than likely would have been the first boot had they gone to that first tribal. He's then left out of the schoolyard pick to determine the new tribes, getting sent to exile, and just being put on Kasaya by default after they lost a member. From there, I'd say he was on the outs, not a part of that core group, which I consider to be Aris, Courtney, Danielle, and Shane. He had a very rocky relationship with Aris to the point where Aris was willing to get rid of him during the Bob Dog vote. And he doesn't do that much to save himself either, as it's mainly the woman driving that vote. At the merge, he's kind of in a swing position where Terry tries getting in the flip. However, he ultimately sticks with the old Kasayas. And he pretty much remains with them for the rest of the game, despite not being in that great position within that group, and despite Terry trying multiple times to get in the flip. And obviously he's medevaced at the final seven due to digestive issues, but by then the Kasaias were getting pretty close to turning on each other, I mean as Terry was the last remaining Lamina, so it was either going to be that round if Terry won immunity, or the next round if Terry was able to be voted out there. And I don't think there was much of a path to a Bruce win, with no one really wanting to take him to the end, except for possibly Terry and maybe Courtney. But even then, he might have had a chance against Courtney or possibly Danielle in a jury vote, but I don't think those scenarios were particularly likely. I don't think there are many people willing to take uh, Bruce to the end. So that's a big reason that I don't have him super high on the list. And aside from that, he was largely just a follower in the game. He didn't really drive any votes. He was just someone just content to be in the majority group, never really considered flipping despite there being opportunities to do so. So for all those reasons, I have him relatively low at number seven, but the fact that he at least made it towards the end game and was technically, his path was technically closer to happening than some of these earlier boots we were talking about earlier is the main reason I have him here at number seven. Now we're moving on to number six, and we have someone who's pretty similar to Bruce in a lot of ways. I mean, he was a bit more active in the game earlier on, and was certainly better positioned in the pre-merge. But like Bruce, he kind of fell into a bad position as the game went on, didn't really do much to fix that. And by the time they were medevaced, they were kind of in danger anyway. So at number six, we have James Clement, and obviously this is his Micronesia game. And again, I mean, his early game is fine. I mean, he's a part of the couple's alliance with Parvati, Ozzy, and Amanda. While we see them rope in fair play, I think there was a chance fair play could have flipped on them at that first vote had he not quit the game. But Johnny Fairplay quitting the game certainly helped this group get the numbers on the favorites tribe, allowing them to take out Yao Man at the next tribal. He gets to the swap with him and Parvati on one side, Penner and Eliza on another side, and the fans in the middle. Now we see that his side technically gets the numbers, but it's more so poverty, like getting like on the good side of Natalie and Alexis. Obviously, they become much closer to poverty than they are to Jane's, which kind of weakens Jane's positioning moving forward. 
Now, obviously, they never go to Tribal during the post-swap, but I don't think Janes would have gone home anyway, even, even if they had gone, but it's certainly something to note. And really, as the game goes on, he even loses Parvati, who ends up forming the Black Widow Brigade. He technically votes in the majority for much of the early merge, voting out people like Eliza and Jason. However, by the final eight, he's at the bottom, pretty much. At the final eight, the Black Widow Brigade split the vote between him and Jason, with Jason as the target there. And by the time he's medevaced at the final seven with an infected finger, James was going to be the next to go unless he won out from that point. So obviously he was someone who had a pretty good start to the game, but definitely saw his position worsen as the game went on. And while he tried at several points to get back into the majority he wasn't very effective and i don't think there's really much he could do to really get back into that majority i think he waited way too long to really do anything of effectiveness so that's a big reason that i have james here in number six although like bruce he at least made it towards the end game and probably had a better shot of winning but again he's here at number six now we're moving on to number five and we have a person who was taken out at the final five, and that is Eric Reichenbach. Now, the thing about Eric is he is technically in the majority for a decent chunk of the game. However, he's rarely in the core of things, and him getting to the final five like wasn't really something that I find too impressive. Now, right away, he's on the outs on the Francesca vote. That's not particularly great, but I don't think he would have been the next to go. He wasn't in that great of a position. He gets an all right swap where the favorites have a four to three majority, but they never go to travel anyway. He also has the option of flipping to the Malcolm, Eddie, Reynolds side or the three amigos. Although by the merge, he flips to the Stealth R Us group where he remains for pretty much the rest of the game, although he's on the outskirts of that group. He does flip at the three amigos tribal to take out Philip, but immediately flips back at the next tribal to vote out Malcolm. At the final six, he votes to save Brenda despite having no real shot of enacting that plan. And then, of course, he's medevaced immediately afterwards. Now, again, the thing about Eric and the reason I have him higher than like Bruce or James is that he did at least make it to the final five. He was technically closer to reaching the end than those two were. I feel like Bruce had very little shot of winning out. And while James probably had a better shot of winning out in immunities, like, obviously, that was at the final seven he would have needed to win out from. So, obviously, that's a much taller task. Eric, I feel like, definitely had an easier path to the end. Like, I feel like he wasn't the next to go. Eddie probably would have gone out at final five. Final four is probably where he would need to win immunity if he wants to stay in the game. And I think he could definitely do that. I mean, he's definitely not the worst uh, challenge performer in the world. But, obviously, there's also the fact that he doesn't really have much of a shot of winning the game, especially at that point where both Cochran and Don were still in the game. I feel like both of them beat him at the end, and it was pretty much impossible for him to win in a final three scenario from that point on. Although I feel like in a final two against Sherry, he definitely had a much better shot there, but that wasn't going to happen. Obviously, Eric was closer to getting to the end than any of the people we just talked about, even if he didn't have that great of a shot of winning. And I also feel like he wasn't targeted as much as Bruce or James, which is a big reason I have him here at number five. Although, admittedly, I don't think his game was that impressive either. So there's that. Now we're moving on to number four. And we have someone pretty similar to Eric, except they actually had a final three deal that more than likely would have gone through had they not been medevaced. It's just a matter of them not winning at the end. That obviously bunts them back down. But then again, same thing applies for Eric. And here at number four, we have Joe Del Campo from Survivor Co. Wrong. Now, obviously, Joe's kind of sort of a weird player to talk about as well. He's one of the older players from his tribe. However, he's able to integrate into the majority all right. He builds a very close bond with Debbie, and they're even able to flip Aubrey and Neil to their side at their first tribal to put out Liz. Not really much danger early on. At the swap, he's handed a pretty favorable split. I mean, obviously the brains are initially able to hold numbers by voting out Anna, but by that next tribal, we see Aubrey flip, despite his wishes, and he's left out of the Peter vote. At the merge, he sticks with the old brains and forms a new majority alliance. At least, he was never really the main decision maker here. I mean, we see that during the Debbie round, where Joe wants to keep Debbie around, but just doesn't get his way there. 
but he's in the majority for the rest of the game. They pick off the opposition of Scott, Julia, Jason, and by the final five, he was in a position to reach the end with Aubrey and Ty. Granted, he most likely loses in that final three, but he was at least positioned to get there. He had the path there, but unfortunately, he's medevaced at the final five due to issues he had on the reward. I mean, obviously, the fact that he could have gotten to the end had he not been medevaced is more than I can say for any of the people we already talked about on this list. But obviously, the main reservations here are, one, despite him being in the majority for most of the game, he was never really the core decision maker, as I feel like other people like Debbie and Aubrey were much more integral in making the decisions for the group he was in. And obviously, he doesn't win at the end. I mean, obviously, that's a big knock there. But considering the rest of the field, I feel like number four is a good place for him. He's definitely one of the better players to have been medevac, so I have him here at number four. All right, moving on to number three, and believe it or not, the rest of the people on this list are all people who were medevac in the pre-merge. However, I was pretty impressed by the games that they played on this season, and I feel like they definitely, at least for two of them, would have fared much better had they not been medevac when they did. But at number three, we have from Survivor One World, we have Colton Cumby. Yeah, I know people don't like Colton, but I mean, you gotta respect the guy. I mean, he played twice and was never voted out, obviously making him a Survivor legend. But all jokes aside, I mean, he did play a pretty good game, at least in the pre-merge of One World. Early on, he took advantage of the One World format to hang out with the women. While this allows him to get his tribe's idol from Sabrina after she finds it, this isn't the best decision as it, not, as it not only affects his relationship with the men, but potentially makes him a big threat moving forward. Even so, it doesn't backfire on him too much as he's able to build the Misfits Alliance, which ends up being the majority on that men's tribe. And he's a pretty dominant force on the men's tribe as well, even getting them to give up immunity so they can vote up Billy. He gets a pretty good swap as well, where he has most of his allies with him. And from there, he orchestrates the Monica blindside. And he would have been in a good position had that tribe gone back to tribal. However, he's medevac before that can happen. So on the surface, I think Colton played a pretty dominant game and had a pretty loyal alliance behind him as well. However, it's not without its problems. One is the move to give up immunity. While it's somewhat impressive that he was able to get his way there, I do think it was still a mistake as it unnecessarily puts you down the numbers and potentially risks you getting blindsided if people feel like you're being too domineering. And while he had something against Billy, I mean, it wasn't worth giving up immunity just for that. Along those lines, he also treats the people outside of his lines pretty terribly. We see that with Billy, of course, but we also see with Christina post-swap. I also think he would have been a massive target at the merge. I can't see how Kim and the women keep him around for too long. And putting all this together, I can't see how he wins a jury vote even if he got to the end. So there's definitely a lot of mistakes that he made despite having the amount of control that he did. But considering the amount of control he did, despite his mistakes, I think that's still somewhat impressive. But I feel like the top two people would have had a bit more longevity in the game had they not been medevaged. Whereas I feel like Colton would have definitely been targeted post-merge for his uh, appearance of being the leader of the men. So because of that, I have Colton here at number three. Now we're moving on to number two, and we have another player who was widely seen as a leader figure for their tribe during their time out there, obviously was taken out before the merge. And I don't know this person gets to the end, even if they did survive uh, their medevac. However, I still think they would have made it at least further than Colton. And number two, we have from Survivor Samoa, Russell Swan. Now, obviously, there's a lot of merit you can give to Russell's game. I mean, he was obviously named the tribe leader at Galoo, and through that, he's kind of in the middle of things for a lot of that pre-merge. I mean, he's obviously the leader of the tribe. He's obviously pretty well-respected, and they only go to one tribal during his entire time in the game. They vote out Yasmin, and... Obviously, by the time of the merge, there was a pretty deep divide on Galoob between the men's alliance with Eric Cardona, J John Fincher, Dave Ball, and the women, namely controlled by uh, Laura, Monica, and Kelly. So there was definitely a divide there, and I still think even if Galoob got to the merge with Russell, there, there probably would have been a 
that crack there at some point. However, I feel like with Russell there, he could have definitely held the numbers a bit more, definitely encouraged Golu to stick together. Obviously, you had that extra numbers advantage, which would have been, well, something for them, although there was a double tribal, so that probably didn't affect things too, too much. However, I, I think Russell would have at least convinced the Galoos to st sit together for at least a round or two, possibly take out Russell, Russell Hant, that is, and potentially get into a position either at the final 10 or the final 9 where the split does happen. And even if the split did happen, I mean, I think Russell would have been in an all right position as he seemed to be pretty well insulated with both groups. Although I think he would have incorrectly tried to save the men, namely with uh, John Fincher and Dave Ball. So I don't know if he gets to the end, even if he gets there, but he definitely had a lot more longevity in the game than Colton did. And couple that with him being the leader of his tribe, I think there's a lot of stuff going on for him. However, I feel like there's one other player who is similar to Russell in a lot of ways, but was clearly more well positioned um, before they were taken out and probably had a much higher chance of getting to the end than Russell did. So because of that uncertainty, I have Russell here at number two. And now a number one, the player I believe is the best player to have been medevaced is the first person to be medevaced. It is Michael Scoopin. Now I know people don't like Scoopin nowadays, and for good reason. However, for just looking at the game he played in Australian Outback, I mean, there's a lot of merit there. Now, granted, he was kind of looked at as a doofus at points, and obviously with that, you know, there was some, like, downside involved, but I feel like he, again, played the leader position pretty well, and by the time he was medevaced, right before the merge, he was pretty well positioned to where we saw people like Jeff and, uh, a Varner and Alicia fighting for his vote, as well as Roger and Elizabeth fighting for his vote. I feel like had Scoopin not been medevac, the Kucha tribe would have gone to the merge with the numbers, and they would have easily been able to bagong the Ogakors, getting them down to the final six. And I feel like if Scoopin had gotten there to the final six with the original Kuchas, he has a very good chance of getting to the end of the game. Now, does he win at the end? I'm not too sure. I mean, it obviously depends on who he chooses to take to the end, where I don't think he necessarily wins against everyone there. But I feel like the fact that he had a much, very clean road to the end of the game uh, against either Roger or Elizabeth is definitely a major a boon to his game. The fact that he was given this path to the end, plus him being this leader figure for his tribe. Now, again, it's, he's not perfect. I mean, it's not guaranteed that he wins. And obviously... I mean, they could have lost the immunity challenge and could have gone down to the 5-5 five -five tie anyway, where obviously who knows how that tiebreaker would have worked out there. However, if Kucha had gotten the numbers at the merge, then Scoopin would have been in a great position to get to the end. And that's a big reason that I have him as high as he is. Couple that with the level of dominance he demonstrated on the season with his positioning. I think that also speaks a lot to his game as well. And because of that, I consider Scoopin to be the best player to have been medevaced in Survivor history. And there we go. That will do it for this video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe. We have plenty more content moving forward between Survivor and Big Brother and Amazing Race. So there's a lot of stuff to look forward to there between like ranking lists, uh, coverage, power rankings, casting potentially. I mean, there's stuff like that as well. So if you liked it, be sure to like and subscribe. Well, for now, that is the video. See ya.